morning, everybody. My name is Hamza Atta. I'm an African, I'm a Nigerian, but I have an Arabic name. Why do I have an Arabic name? And I wonder how many people in the audience here have Arabic or English or German or whatever names. I think it, 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 it goes to the root of the identity crisis that we have here in, um, in Africa. I'm a manufacturer. I produce polystyrene. Polystyrene is foam. It is, um, I use it to build houses, affordable houses. I use it for insulation, and I use it to create monumental and commercial works of art. I've chosen to be part of this productive and this creative part of our economy, you know, and this has taken me on a journey, on a journey through the political, social, and economic underbelly of this country, Nigeria, and I have the scars to prove it. Um, my father was a, a career diplomat, um, so I have the unique experience of really growing up in Nigeria and then growing up in many other countries. Um, but when I was, and, and my father would, my, 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 my worldview was, was, was formed watching this man and this woman um, in the service of Nigeria in countries that they were representing the country. And my father would always tell the whole family that all of us were representing Nigeria. And we shouldn't forget that everything we have now is as a result of Nigeria. And we should make sure that we pay Nigeria back for what Nigeria had done for us. So this is what sculpted me. This is what was in my DNA when I was growing up. Now, when I was 13, my father was ambassador in Cuba. Um, and at that time, you know, I was getting closer to my O-levels and A-levels, so he decided I should go off to boarding school um, so, that they wouldn't, so that this nomadic lifestyle of, of, of the diplomats would not if affect my education further. Um, initially, I was supposed to go to the next island, which was Jamaica. But by the time he sat down with his colleagues and they told him that, ah, Jamaica. <laughs> Jarastafari, your son will start to smoke some ganja, something like this. So immediately, you know, I was I, no. I ended up in cold, damp, rural England. Now, arriving there, I remember driving up the driveway of the school and desperately looking out for a black face, something to belong to. You know, from this diplomatic life, you're always a new face in a new place, so even getting to settle is a problem. I didn't see anybody. I was the only blackie sambo wog in this place. You know, for those of you who don't know these terms, in the, in the 70s, these were just common terms for black people. It was normal. I mean, I remember the first or second day that I was there, there was the groundsman. He was named, his name was JB, and he saw this little black guy running around in their, in their beautiful white public school. And he said, come here, lad. So I went up to him, and he said, what's your name then? And I said, my name is Hamza. And he said, Hamza? Hansen? Hansen? I said, Hamza. Hansa, he goes, oh, that's too bloody hard. I think I call you Henry, you know. And so all the time I was there, I was always, I was, I was called Henry by this poor old um, chap. But you know, I, I, I found my way up this social order by excelling in sport, and I had this passion for art. Um, rugby, in particular, is the sport that I was very good at, and rugby is a game of pure discipline and teamwork. You know, you be, you become a member of, a, of brothers in arms. You are bound together and you depend on each other. So from excelling in this sport, I, I got accepted into this uh, place. But you know, as my, <laughs> as my education was progressing, my father, who was paying all those pounds, was like, my friend, <laughs> this rugby you are playing, you better stop that nonsense. Oh. And you break your neck, I will not take care of you. And that your painting, your painting, uh, you will die. Who is going to take care of you with this painting? You better go and study law, my friend. So I said, okay, sir, and I went and studied law. Now, <laughs> it was about fear. It was about fear and obedience. Um, I went and studied law, but throughout my university career, I kept on playing. And I got signed up by a club called Wigan Rugby League. Now, Wigan Rugby League gave me a 40,000 pound contract. And that, 
in today's Naira is about 20 million Naira. I was 22 years old because I was good at what I was doing. But I couldn't accept. I said, ah, I can't tell my father that I, like, <laughs> you better get me a job in a law firm. So they got me a job in a law firm and I lived my dream playing for the best team in the world. It was like playing for Manchester United or Chelsea. But nobody knew and nobody cared, only me. But I was afraid. I was afraid. So after a year, I thought, my father said, look, this is not your calling. Rugby is not a serious career. What you have to do is you have to come back and serve your country. And that's how I felt. I really felt I needed to come and do something. So I left. I came back, but I knew from working in that law firm for, for a year that I didn't want law. I arrived in Lagos, <laughs> family welcoming committee. <laughs> so when are you starting law school? <laughs> you yeah, are going to law school. Ah, uh -uh. can you eat half baked bread? Can you eat half baked bread? You want to be half baked lawyer? My friend, you are going to law school. So up I went. When I graduated, my father was, you know, African parent. <laughs> this is my son. He's a lawyer. <laughs> you know, but me, I was confused. I was lost. I was disconnected from my passions, and I didn't know what to do. Fortunately, my sister was an interior designer and produced furniture, but with little artisans. So we set up a production line together, and she did the interior design. I handled the production process. That's how I got to understand how to produce and how to project manage. As the thing was taking off, the government decided to remove the ban on the importation of furniture. So what happens next? Everybody starts importing. We cannot compete. We don't have the infrastructure in Nigeria to compete with machine-made mach uh, uh, products from all around the country. So I jumped ship and I started importing furniture instead. But no add-on value. All I was doing was creating jobs for foreigners. Meanwhile, all around me, Nigerians were living in squalor and were jobless. So I started researching building to supplement the furniture and I found this polystyrene building system. Light, insulated, easy to use. I was ecstatic, raised money, bought a factory, and brought it to Abuja here. I thought that I would not be able to cope with the demand from the federal and the state governments. My God, what a shock to the system. How naive I was. I got that powerless feeling again, you know? And, um, what can I tell you? These guys, they just put in obstacles. They put obstacles in your way so that when you want to come and invest in this place, you're not actually able to invest properly. I had to diversify. We had to think out of the box. The interest was running. So we started producing insulation. We started producing bean bags. We started producing pieces of art for monumental and for commercial use. And that took me back to where I could have started from as a young kid if I wanted to do my art. This is what had come out. Now, the music that I came in dancing to was Fela and Nicola Pokuti. Fela is arguably the most famous Nigerian in the world. Fela went off to university to study medicine. And he said, you know what? I ain't doing this. I'm doing music. And you know, I had this this connection with this guy. I used to go to shrine, you know, and dance, you know, to fella. All the girls were there. Then you see those women on the stage twerking. Ah, what do you people call twerking now? We're there watching. But instead of listening to what fella was saying, we were all just dancing to the music. He was telling us about our leaders. He was telling us that these people are not here to progress us. They're going to shackle us the way that the colonial masters came and shackled us. So it's all about them, exclusive systems for them, extractive systems for them. And we stand by and we watch. We're not involved in the, in the, we're not involved in the system. And they say, oh, Nigeria is so big, you can't run it properly. But look at this chocolate bar. Look at this chocolate bar. What do we get? We get 3%. We get 3% by selling cocoa. Three. Everybody else gets the other 97%. Switzerland is famous for chocolate. They don't own cocoa. So imagine what could happen if we were producing here. Just imagine the power. Our crude oil is the same. If you imagine, 3% crude oil. We're not in control of our destinies. But look at an India. Look at India today. What do they do differently from us? They produce. They were colonized by the British. 
but they didn't take their British names. They kept, to, they kept what they had. They kept their language Hindi. They kept their religions. They kept their names. They know who they are. Now, all of us here in this audience, we are Nigeria. We cannot abdicate responsibility for the way that Nigeria is today. We cannot. Now, let me ask you, are you registered to vote? Show me, show me your hands who's registered to vote here. Look at it, not even one quarter of us are registered to vote. Do you know who your senatorial representative is? Do you know what to do if you actually want to run for government? Do you know what to do? We are not powerless. So what are we doing? Please repeat after me. We are not powerless. So I want everybody here to engage. We need to engage. We need to go and educate ourselves. We need to educate ourselves about the rules, especially the political rules. Because it's only when we understand these rules that we'll be able to go and break them. Break them and get involved. And if we get involved and we, and, and we fail, it's okay because these guys are experts in this game now. If we try again, we are more intelligent than three quarters of them because they don't even understand the import of collective personal interest. We will win. Now, I know that all of us are religious. God day. Where are my words? God day. We thank God. No condition is permanent. Ego better. Inshallah. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, all the poorest countries in the world are the most religious. Okay? God helps those people who help themselves. We need to put effort into what we, need, what we want to do. Otherwise, nobody, don't make a mistake, huh? nobody is going to cede power to us in the Game of Thrones. You know the Game of Thrones, right? You watch it. It's real. Okay? Now, I love Nigeria. I'm mad about Nigeria. Mad because I don't like what I experience every day, and mad because I love it. And I love Nollywood, and I love all the creative artists, and I applaud all those farmers and miners who have gotten it together and are doing export great stuff. But I want you to look at yourselves. Let's look at each other, okay? Let's understand how guilty we are in not participating. So please, get out there today. Get out there today and get involved. Join a political party. Join a political group, okay? And let us make this the Nigeria that we can all be proud of. I'm mad about Nigeria, as I've told you. What about you? Thank you.